So we are going to make podcast history here today, and it is the most boring possible type of podcast history. I'm going to have our guest, Jeff Howe, National NFL Insider for the Athletic, sit for five minutes in silence while I do an intro. Jeff, are you ready? <laughs> Can't wait. Very good. All right. Well, look, it's mid-March. We're all doing some form of spring cleaning, so I needed to update some folks on some news around the podcast because I tweeted this out on Friday. Uh, I have a new YouTube channel. This is not anything particularly special because, look, anyone can create a YouTube channel if we're being honest. But what will be special about this channel is you can not only find every single episode of Pat's Interference, you can find new draft content. I will have them on that channel. But plus a new YouTube exclusive segment to this podcast, which Jeff is going to debut with me here today. It's called Five Off the Field. More on that in a second. In the meantime, you can find interviews with Kendrick Bourne, Devin McCourty, Mike Giardi. I would pass on that one. Uh, and Aaron Schatz talking about everything that's been recent and topical and anywhere kind of tangential to the Patriots over the last two, three weeks. Now, five off the field. This is going to be a part of the podcast that if you are watching on YouTube, all you have to do is go to my channel and then click and find this separate segment called five off the field. where We will be talking with the same guest who just talked everything about the Patriots that week or today. Of course, it's Jeff. And then we do a non Patriots topic and it's not gardening. It's not going to be hygiene. It's going to be something unique to the guest, usually football related or adjacent. And we get into that with them. So you get to know the guest better. We have more content for you and get to kick back and have a little bit more fun because there was a comment. Um, all right, we'll bring in Jeff for this because I posted that Kendrick Bourne interview I did last week. Usually there's a couple comments on Twitter where you could say the reply has been muted from this account or some version of like I've muted that person who's replied which I think is a healthy way to go about Twitter. But one of them I check every once in a while just to see, you know, maybe uh, maybe I'll bring him back. And they said, this was a new side of your reporting I'd never seen before. I was like, oh, that's very nice. Because I typically like to think I talk to Kendrick Bourne like most people. Um, do you take the same approach to Twitter? You and I have texted about this a little bit here, back and forth. It's tough. I really, really want to be engaged with everybody on Twitter as much as possible. I mean, there are some really nice supportive people out there i mean sometimes like you quite frankly you just can't keep up with all of it like if you tweet out something that whatever goes viral or blows up or something like that you just can't keep up with the mentions but like i, I really want to be able to respond to as many questions as i can but it's just gotten so nasty i mean it's it's so bad so i don't look at it too often uh, not nearly as much as i used to just because I need a break i mean it's just <laughs> there's only so many times you can read somebody telling me that i suck before you start to one yeah or just any out. mike giardi tweets i get it yeah so right. I, it's a good balance okay back to jeff uh in the corner for a second then we're going to bring him in for a ton of great patriots content but when we get in off the field you're going to learn a little bit more actually we'll tease this right now in this separate segment about what life is like as an insider as jeff has come to grow and know and really master over the last couple of years at The Athletic. So that is our topic here for today. An example, five minutes off the field. It might be five questions. We tend to go long here on the podcast. This is a brand new YouTube exclusive segment. You will find five off the field with our guests. Now, later this week, I'm going to be answering every single mailbag question that you ask. And this will be via Twitter. It will be via email. And if you want your own video segment, we've had Jordan on, we've had Brian on, we've had... Um, I don't know why I did this to myself because I'm forgetting our second guest and now I look like a jerk. Uh, Shadi was his last name. <laughs> He's a regular listener and I hope he continues to. But if you want to join the show like them, donate to Boston Children's Hospital, $1 minimum. Screenshot that donation and send it in with your question via Twitter or email and you will be on the show this week, next week, or sometime soon. Last thing and then we're going to get into the Patriots. I mentioned a few weeks ago that the Patriots will spend big in free agency. It is Tuesday morning. We are eight days into free agency. Here's what the numbers are. The Patriots rank 12th in total money committed to fresh free agent contracts. They rank 14th, by league average, in total guarantees. They rank 9th in full guarantees, meaning no matter what, that player is getting the money, injury, act of God, whatever it might be. And they rank 7th in first year hard cash spent. Now, they still rank overall because, again, speaking to Twitter, nothing is ever good enough. Even if you just want to tweet about 2024 free agent contracts and ranks, people's going to bring up, that's so misleading. No, no, no. I'm not talking about anything else. It's just here are the ranks. This is the year, and these are the numbers. 
But in 2024 overall, when we step back and we zoom out, the Patriots still rank seventh lowest in amount of cash spent so far this year. Now, the league year literally started last week. They're at $193.26 million. I bring all of this up to say that, again, a few weeks ago, the Patriots will spend big. Again, a couple of those ranks are in the top 10. To me, that qualifies. But the reason I said this, which has caused some confusion, is that there's a minimum for cash spending in the NFL. It's not year to year. It's within a, th- within a three-year window. The three-year window right now is 2024 to 2026. Given where the Patriots were pre-free agency, which was at the bottom of the league in cash spending for 2024 based on their committed contracts and the way that they were scheduled, it behooved them to spend about $100 million just to stay on pace for this year alone to reach the cash spending minimum, which will, of course, be at the end of 2026, meaning that they would at least spend 90% of this year's cap. Again, you spend 90% in every single year, you're on schedule, you meet the minimum. That said, they are $193 million right now committed in, uh, in cash for 2024. 90% of this year's cap is $229 million. So when you add in the draft class, 193 goes to 203. They're still about $25, $26 million short of meeting 90% of this year's cap. It does not mean they're going to violate a rule as far as the minimum cash spending, but it does mean they will be behind schedule unless they make about $25 to $26 million more uh, in inroads as far as their spending going into the next three years. So that's as far as I want to talk about dollars and cents. We will get into whether the Patriots should have spent more here in a second. And this is where we bring Jeff back. How did it feel to make the most boring, silent piece of history in podcast <laughs> we've had here on Pads and Fans? I'll be honest. When you brought me in for the Twitter question, I was half asleep. So I hope I answered it correctly. <laughs> Jeff had an extended St. Paddy's Day uh, celebration and weekend with the Fantasy Baseball Draft. Old friends. I'm about to have the same. Uh, not going drinking, you know, Saturday, Sunday into Monday for you last night. Uh, mine will be this Saturday. 18 years with fantasy baseball and I still hang out with these people or they, they still tolerate me. I think is the best way to put that. Um, who's your first round pick, by the way, this is, this is completely unrelated to anything, but you and I both kind of watch the Sox and then keep in touch with the race, the rest of the league. Like, did you know, at least your first round pick this year? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's Otani. So <laughs> that, was, that was an easy one, but it was, uh, I had the 10th pick in a 10 person league. So I took Otani and then I, I don't even remember who my second pick was. I, me and baseball, just it's not it's not what it used to be. Yeah, we've all been on a break. I think uh, grew up late '90s, early 2000s, the glory days. I mean, everything now that was the glory days for anything. Period. Right? Because you're older and you just look right. back and you got the nostalgic touch. But especially baseball, I don't know. Maybe I'm coming back around. Maybe baseball's you know fixed itself, realized the error's way. The games are faster. The Red Sox still stink, which is a bummer. But uh, I don't know. I'm willing to come back to baseball. All right. Baseball is not for another two weeks. Patriots for agency, as I mentioned, they are in the top half of spending, whatever way you want to cut it. But I think the larger takeaway is when you look at the names, the Patriots did not get better, Jeff. And you hear this on the radio. You hear it on podcasts. You see it on TV. Some folks have written this. This is the first of our true or false statements with the Patriots and for agency. The Patriots did not get better over the last eight days. True or false? True. Uh, I think they did some good work, but that doesn't mean that they got better. And it's also weird because you could also coach it and say, I still think they're going to be better next year than four and 13. And I think they've laid the groundwork for that. And they've kind of started on a path here where the results should be moving in a better direction. I like the fact that they've retained their important free agents, but to say that they've gotten better, I, I don't know how you can do that. I mean, You could also say, well, Jacoby Brissett is probably going to play quarterback better than Mac Jones did. The other side of that is Jacoby Brissett shouldn't play quarterback next season. It should be a rookie. So I don't, it's hard to say. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways you can go with that question, but I think ultimately, no, they did not get better, but that doesn't mean that they've gotten off to a bad start. In my opinion, I'm going to say false. I, I think it's a very, very slim margin but I do think they got better and you have to go positionally in order to figure this out. And you mentioned Jacoby Brissett. It is, it's an interesting case study in eye test or your recent memory of a player and some of the numbers, because you look at last year, granted tiny sample backed up Sam Howell, who just got traded Washington wants no more to do with him, but clearly was a situation where he was the backup. Let's see what they have in the young guy and move forward. And what was the season they tanked halfway through? He goes 18 to 23, 224 yards, three touchdowns, 
partly against a good Jets defense, gets hurt late in the year, then he's out. The year before, he was eighth in QBR, 17th in total EPA, and in top, uh, I think it was top 12 by PFF grades. So the raw numbers are 2,600 yards, 12 touchdowns, six interceptions, 64% completion percentage. And folks will know, all of that came under new Patriots offensive coordinator, Alex Van Pelt, when the two of them were in Cleveland. And there's a lot more around him, good offensive line, Amari Cooper, et cetera, that helps, Nick Chubb. But to me, that says that version of Jacoby, even if you want to knock him down some pegs, around the 20th to 25th, or let's call him the 26th best quarterback in the league, is automatically better than what you got last year from Mac and what you will probably ever get from Bailey Zappi. Slight upgrades also to me. Antonio Gibson over Ezekiel Elliott. Uh, Austin Hooper over Mike Gesicki. Farrell Brown's the third tight end, if you feel bad about it, whatever. And then KJ Osborne over Devontae Parker. KJ Osborne had a minimum of 540 yards each of the last three seasons. You know how many times Devontae Parker hit 540 yards, Jeff, over the last three seasons? I'm going to guess zero. Zero. Well done, sir. Uh, here's the caveat, though. He had 539 one year. So this is not entirely <laughs> kind or fair to Devontae Parker. The, the but numbers again, are what they are, man. Yes. Now, I will say the offensive line is worse. Say what you will about Trent Brown. I've, I've you know, look, chatted with Trent a lot in the locker room the last couple of years. Got to know him. Had to write some things that did not make him look particularly good. It's not my fault. Things he said, things he did. We all watched the end half of last season. But without that kind of talent, that raw ability, even just the warm body in the room, the offensive line is worse. I just see when you bring back the entire defense, upgrades at receiver, Antonio Gibson over Zeke. If you want me to explain that, he's got better pass blocking grades, more yards after contact. The fumbles, don't get me, are a real issue. But Zeke is well past his prime. Antonio Gibson still in his athletic peak. Um, that, that, to me, is where it sticks out. Like, if they were to run it back last year with this group, I don't think they're a four-win team. There's a lot more that went into that, the kicking situation, coaching dysfunction, et cetera. Is any of that persuasive to you? No, I, I think it, it all makes sense. I'm not necessarily sure that Hooper is an upgrade over Gasicki or, or what have you. I mean, I think it at uh, kind of splitting hairs a little bit. Yeah. But, I mean, again, I, I think – there's, there's just so much more to be done. And I know like w what questions are coming up, so I don't want to like jump ahead and, <laughs> and get to some other points that I know we'll be able to make eventually. Yeah. All right. Now, I, I want to be clear here, too. I, I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth. When I say if they were a five-win team next year, that's better than four and 13. That means, you know, with this group playing last year's schedule, yeah, I think it's a little bit better. Austin Hooper, I think it was a, it was a buy low. If you want to argue about Kosicki, fine. Kosicki's issue here, I think, was the fit. Right. Like they have a bunch of big slots. That's that's what he is. He's, he's not going to be able to play there the way he would in some other systems. He has to play in line where they put him last year inexplicably more than he had been basically since his rookie year. It didn't work out. Austin Hooper can play a little bit more in line. But when you're arguing between two players who live somewhere in the low 70s in Madden ratings, um, you're not doing great podcasting and you're probably wasting your time. So we'll move on. Um, defense, we should say, too, they lost Jalen Mills when your deal with the Giants. Jabril Peppers and Kyle Duggar, your starters to safety. Sione Takitaki, whose name we cannot say enough on this podcast. Sione Takitaki, in for Mac Wilson, to me, is a wash, um, and he's a little bit cheaper. Number two, true or false, the Patriots should have been more aggressive and spent more than they have. True. Uh, I think when you, you know, you laid out the financial aspect pretty thoroughly uh, off the <laughs> jump here. So, like, they you went from half asleep to, to like, three quarters as I was going through all that. True or false? <laughs> they they had uh, money to burn. They still do. I think when you're in a position where, you know, you go into free agency and you're one of the you're the one of the teams that has the most room to spend or the most cap to, to spend or whatever, you know, there are opportunities to get. I don't want to say reckless, but over aggressive. Like you can splurge on one or two players. That's not going to set your roster back by a considerable amount, knowing how important the draft is to this rebuild. So I think. You know, Calvin Ridley, like, I don't want to sound like a hypocrite. I, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I said I would absolutely go up to 20 for Calvin Ridley. And beyond that, I would be hesitant. So I don't want it to come across as like, oh, well, you know, you can't have it both ways. But looking at that contract and knowing how important he might have been to your offense for the next two to three years, I mean, I, I would have considered trying to get a little more aggressive. And, you know, would you get a little aggressive on a Saquon Barkley or a Hollywood Brown or, or what have you. Like I, I know the running back argument and, and I'm, I believe in that and all that other stuff, but like 
again, this is a team that is going to need to support a rookie quarterback and or a young quarterback for a, a considerable amount of time. So you want to put good pieces around him. I mean, do you want to get into – you certainly need to improve the offensive line. I mean, try to, I don't know, throw a little more guaranteed money at a Tyron Smith uh, that, you know, the Jets were able to get. Or, or you know, just – boost the tackle position in, in some way, shape, or form so you're not fully committed to, like, making sure that you find one in the draft. Now, you still draft one, but, like, now you're a little more desperate. Uh, or, or at least you're trending in that direction where you might have to be desperate. So, yeah, I mean, it would have been nice to see them get a little more aggressive for an offensive piece or two. Um, so they didn't. They did not. And I think the only fair way to have this conversation, right, is to identify names and numbers. You hit on a few there. Calvin Ridley goes for four years, $92 million, 50 of which was guaranteed. I, I've been on the record already saying if you want to be upset about it, I get it. Personally, I, I'm not because I think, again, the Patriots probably would not have landed him just merely matching that contract. You're you're right. going up now to four for 96, maybe close to 100 when you consider everyone's favorite topic of free agency – State income tax, uh, in addition to the attractiveness of the market and the quarterback situation, the coaching staff, everything else, he's going to play with DeAndre Hopkins in Tennessee. Like That's in addition to a roster they've continued to build out. Marquise Brown is a name that I threw out, very much a plan B, not someone I think is a great fit here, but at least gives you a little bit more dynamism outside that they've been sorely lacking for years. He signs for one year, $7 million. Again, the tax for the Patriots probably makes that a one for 12, 13, 14, maybe. Um, up to maximum value type of contract. Jonah Williams, who I've said in this podcast before, the Patriots are not strongly involved with, only got two years and 30 million. So it's 15 million per is a guy who could play left tackle for you as he has most of his career at an above average level, I would say, not top 10, probably not top 12, but he's in there. And now you've got Charles Leno, who's you know obviously in the back line of his career. Um, the only other names that came to mind, for me and Tyron Smith is in there. I just think he was a he was ring chasing, which is the other part of this conversation we never talk about. What does the player want, right? Like it's typically the most money, but in certain situations like his, that might not be the case. Edge was the last position that I thought of, where if you wanted to throw a bag at Jonathan Greenard, who came up in this podcast last week with Aaron Schatz, um, you know he, he got a lot of money from Minnesota, who also signed another name I kept an eye on, Andrew Van Ginkle, who I think hit free agency at the best possible time. Not only just because of the career stats, the PFF grades, plays really well against the Patriots in week two. And you'd be surprised at, like, I think the outsized impact on our memory. You play well in a primetime game, people don't forget. Um, but he got two years for $20 million, $14 million guaranteed. He would have been the pick for me over Anthony Jennings. I think he's just better than Anthony Jennings. But I understand why they brought back Uche and Anthony Jennings, basically at the price of one Andrew Van Ginkle. And I think that's fine business. Yeah, I, I certainly, I agree with you there. And Uche, I mean, really threw him a bone by accepting significantly less money uh, to return to the Patriots and really bet on himself. And I mean, I, I still think I'm gonna I'm gonna hang on to this one for as long as humanly possible. I still think Josh Uche has a chance to be like, that breakout <laughs> player that everybody really wants to see. I'm not gonna give up on that. Um, you were still on the beat, right, for that draft class. I was, yeah. Um, yeah, so we were doing like dueling profiles and that, talking to our, our, your, your guy, uh, Don Brown. Um, yeah, yep. And catching up. I mean, he just, yeah, I, I don't know. You you add to Josh Uche. I've said plenty about him. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, they. He, if he breaks out again, he, as a pass rusher, I, I mean, the market was sort of tough too because it was sort of flooded with a B rate, B minus rate pass rushers. So, I don't know, maybe next year the market looks, I have no idea who's going to hit the open market next year. But, you know, there's a chance if he had, if he hits 10 sacks this year. I mean, there's, Gerard Mayo could just say, you know what, I'm going to turn you loose. Like, we're going to help you get those sacks. We're going to help you get paid next offseason. Because if you get paid, that means you had a great year for me. And, and I think there's something to be said for that. You know, going back to what does the player want too? like, that's, you know, I mentioned Saquon Barkley. That was more of a long shot, but, you know, it's an interesting sort of one. Like, if you're the Patriots, how are you going to out recruit him against the Eagles, a team that is expected to contend for the NFC Championship once again? Uh, it, that's tough. You got to throw a ton of money at him. Uh, Hollywood Brown, like you were saying, I mean, do you want to play for the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes, or do you want to go to a rebuild? <laughs> so yeah, you're going to need to throw a significant amount of money. I think the luxury tax thing, like I'm not going to shake a you know stick at five million dollars here, but like I was 
talking to people, but like how big of a deal is that? And like you're talking like a five percent hit uh, between Florida and Massachusetts. So, like, yeah, again, if you're gonna sign a hundred million dollar contract, like I'm not just sitting here saying like throw away five million or whatever, but like I, I feel like the luxury tax thing got so blown out of proportion that it was like, well, this is the difference between like a hundred million and like forty million. Like it's just like cartoon like monopoly money here. Like it's not that big of a deal. Uh, but again, when you are at the very early stages of a rebuild and you play in a cold weather town, it's and you don't have a quarterback yet, uh, yeah, you you have to overcompensate with money. Yeah, I, I just realized I didn't answer this question. I will say true. You know, whether it was one of those names or someone I missed, I, I think that it, it just behooved them to add a difference maker. They had they had the resources. You had the cap. You had positions of need where you can get guys plug and play. Jonathan Greenard, even Marquise Brown, I would have been fine with. Like I just think part of this was a perception issue with Gerard with a throwaway line at the end of a WWE WEEI interview. WWE interview. I'm all for. If Gerard ever wants to do those, those wrestling interviews, please go ahead, Gerard. Um, really set the expectations in a way that not only. Okay, you could infer based on the numbers, things I've talked about here, they're going to spend big, they have to, they've got the space, yada, yada. No, no, they're on the record saying we're going to do that. And he tried to walk it back to our mutual friend and mentor, Karen Garigian, but the damage was done publicly anyway. So I'm just curious how much disappointment there is if Gerardo just never said that, because it's important to understand that the, the whole for agency is framed by our expectations going in where that had a large influence. That all said, again, I think they should have spent a little bit money, a ton more, no, the history of team spending that much in free agency being in the top five in all those categories not very good but one of the aforementioned players yeah bring him aboard it's a new era not just for the patriots but for the pats interference podcast brought to you now by prize picks the largest daily fantasy sports platform in america i'm making player picks watching the celtics points rebounds and i get to test my skills like you can on prize picks this season because it's the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports if you have the skills you can turn 10 bucks into 250 bucks with just a few taps. And then here's the best part, quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, an enormous selection of players and stat types, which all make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app, plus a review policy, which means you get your money back in case of injury, the only DFS platform to offer an insurance policy. Again, prize picks has been a ton of fun with the Celtics. You can also go with the Bruins, any number of different sports, games, players, plays, and options. So right now, go to prizepicks.com slash CLNS and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash CLNS and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, the Patriots roster, that all said, is at least solid enough, not good, not great, just solid enough to support a rookie quarterback right now. No, uh, false. Um, I, I They still have they have room to grow. I mean, they, they, they just don't have any dynamic playmakers. Like, you put a Jaden Daniels or a Drake May in this offense right now, like, you don't have, I'm not saying everybody needs a Jamar Chase or a Justin Jefferson, but, like, you don't have that one guy who you're sitting there saying he is going to be a considerable help to this young player. I mean, look at the Bears just went and got Keenan Allen uh, to to pair with um, uh, DJ Moore and, and you know Komet, and I think they got Gerald Everett. I mean, like that's a, a roster that is building towards some success for a young quarterback. Whereas the Patriots still have a lot of holes, and uh, I. I really don't like the argument that you need to build up every other position before you go and get a, a rookie quarterback or you draft a quarterback high. Like, I think that is an extremely flawed argument. Um, but, you know, they're going to have, <laughs> there's going to be some growing pains next season with, with this young quarterback. Um, you know, there's, there's a time there could be some surprise trades or some sort of shocking move or two that happens immediately after we close down this podcast and, and we look dumb or whatever, but like, Right now, it is what it is. Like, they still have a lot of room to grow. They're going to need to really solidify the offensive line. They're going to have to be really committed to the running game. Ramondre Stevenson is going to have to have a terrific season. He's going to have to stay healthy. I mean, they just – a lot of things are going to have to really come together uh, to offset the fact that they still have some holes at wide receiver. I agree. This is false. 
the roster is not ready to support rookie quarterback. They need to add more specifically to two groups, offensive line and the receiving core. Receiving core, if it's not worst in the league, it's at least bottom five. And there is a scary, scary floor for the offensive line that rated among last year's worst in terms of ESPN's pass block win rate or run block win rate. And some of that stuff, you know, it's great that we can quantify and you stop the two and a half seconds to the offensive lineman win or did he lose? And then it's, you know, really cut and dry. It's not the case, I think, in every sort of play. But you look at PFF, you look with your own eyes, adjusted line yards. There are lots of different metrics now for line play. It was a bad offensive line. And we all understand that. Bringing back Michael Money was great. Maybe some of the rookies from last year, Antonio Maffi, said he's out with develop. Uh, David Andrews getting up there. Cole Strange is going to be coming off another injury. And there's no left tackle. If you go to ourlads.com, my go-to for depth charts in the NFL, because uh, just don't trust the team website. Connor McDermott is LT1 right now for this team, and you just, you just can't have it. But I'm really glad you brought up the point about some people believe you need to have the roster completely ready. Then you bring in the quarterback, because I just could not disagree with this more. I, it is asking for too much. It shows a lack of touch with how teams have built outside of New England in the last 20 to 25 years. It is, it is as if you want to buy a car, but only if you have a new house with a driveway and a garage and an automatic door closer for that garage. No, no, no. You, you can park on the street. Yeah, your car, this quarterback might get nicked up or get sideswiped. You can still drive. And the ability that you have to drive with that car is going to change your life in so many more ways where you have control over your travel and your destiny, wherever you want to go next, because you have that quarterback or that car more than just a nice place to house him overnight and make sure he doesn't get scraped by the dude who's biking home drunk um, from work. Or hopefully not from work. Beyond. <laughs> <laughs> right, you get my point. Like, it's just asking for too much, okay? Not not everyone gets a, a, a kid and a house and a car all right in a way. What is most important, okay? Right now, as far as where you can be and what you can do and all the things that open up possibilities in your life is that car. And it's a rough analogy, but I just think that's the best way to get this across is if not now, when with this kind of deal that you would have? If not now, when with the quarterback class? Because it's a bad class next year. You're getting Kirk Cousins with the torn Achilles is the big prize of free agency, right? 36, 35-year-old dude going to Atlanta. Franchise quarterbacks, even if they're not a guarantee, are not to be found everywhere. You need to seize on one when you have the chance, and they do here. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I can – I there's another part of the argument that I nobody can really argue against. Um, the bust rate high on high quarterbacks is, is considerable, and there is reason to be wary for that. But as I've said a million times, like, just because the Raiders screwed up with Jamarcus Russell doesn't mean that you shouldn't take a quarterback – you know, 15 years later, whatever it is, like just you can't compare those two situations. What you need to do is you need to be confident in your evaluation. And if you think that player is worth that pick and you can continue to develop him once he's in your building, you have to go ahead and make that pick. You know, the other part of it, too, is like it like, yeah, it certainly makes sense to put a rookie quarterback or a young quarterback or any quarterback into a good situation. Hell, look at Tom Brady's last year. The offensive coaching was so bad that the greatest quarterback of all time as a 45 year old couldn't, uh, you know, outmaneuver some of the, the flaws that the Bucks had during his final season. It doesn't matter if you're a rookie quarterback or, or wherever you are in your career, you need help around you with the coaching and with the players. And, if you build up a competent roster at a bunch of different places, you're probably not going to be in position to draft one of those top two or three quarterbacks whatever year you're ready to do that. I mean, look at the Bears. Again, a team that is really starting to finally, after decades, trend in the right direction. They only have the number one pick because of a trade from the previous year. So they got fortunate. I mean, they wouldn't be. Otherwise, they'd have the ninth pick. And I mean, they still do, of course. But you know what I'm getting at. And, and then, you know, you mentioned the Falcons example. Like that's a team that has been basically a bottom feeder for the last few years. And I think this is the, I don't know, it feels like the third straight year they've had the eighth pick or whatever it is. Like they're in the bottom of the top 10 once again. And the reason why they had to spend so much money on Kirk Cousins is because they haven't been in position to draft their guy. And, you know, they, I guess there's a lot of tangents we can go off on that one too. But they're, the, the fact of the matter is if the quarterback is there, you don't pass them by. And, you know, people could say, well, look at what happened with Patrick Mahomes or Jordan Love or Aaron Rodgers or Josh Allen. You know, those guys weren't necessarily the top quarterback in their class, but 
you know, the, the situation that they were in was also very, very good. And they gave them the time to grow and develop. I mean, Josh Allen's first couple of years was really difficult. You put Patrick Mahomes, like everybody wants to debate, is it Brady or Belichick or both or whatever? Uh -huh. Patrick Mahomes is with a guy who basically everybody around the league believes is the best play caller in the business and Andy Reid. I mean, that goes a long way. So you just, you can't wait until everything is perfect around you. At some point, you just got to, you got to make that move if you think you have the right one. Yeah. Okay. This is a perfect lead into our next two. And let's hit this first one quickly and then move to the, to the second one. Um, KJ Osborne signs on St. Patrick's day. Very glad that Doug was able to take care of this for me. I'll leave it at that. Uh, he will finish as the Patriots most important outside free agent signing of this year's class. True or false? Uh, I mean, what's, who's his competition? Um, <laughs> Well, again, guy who has had 540 yards in yeah. each of the last three seasons or more. He averaged 615 as the number three in Minnesota. And a lot of us can make a decent living being in the number three receiver in Minnesota when you're with Justin Jefferson and for a time there, Adam Thielen. Um, and now Jordan Addison, obviously, from USC. So uh, his life gets harder in New England. He's also just a capable receiver that they've signed, which makes a big deal given the state of the, the receiver room. So is he the most important one or no? I'll just say false because there's I, I'm not trying to like disrespect him. I just I think there still needs to be other moves coming. I, they just they got to keep plugging away at this thing. So it's false to mystery, man. Just <laughs> yes. the TVD signing. OK, I uh, don't know false. who it will be. Not it because be of the mystery man or the, the free agent to come. It's because of Jacoby Brissett. And again, I want to underscore, I read off a bunch of numbers that made his 2022 season a little bit rosier than it was. It's still better than you remember, which was the point of those numbers I rattled off. He's not a full-time starter in the NFL. He knows that. He's a bridge guy. He's somewhere between 25th and 35th best quarterback in the league. But what he can do for this franchise is take the hits for the next guy. You listed off Aaron Rodgers, Jordan Love, Patrick Mahomes, all of whom who sat a year. If Drake May or Jane Daniels, as determined by the coaching staff, not the media, but the coaching staff, says he's not ready. We want to preserve him, develop him a little bit longer. You have a guy here who can run the offense, who has experience with the coaches, is respected in the locker room, and knows where to be and what to do. And that guy who will do that for New England at a cheap price, who's got experience doing it here in other places, is invaluable, if anything, just to be the pinata under center and in the pocket until those guys are ready. because. That is the most important thing is the development of the next guy. In the meantime, Jacoby Brissett is someone that you can trust. You're not going to win a ton of games with. But spoiler alert, the Patriots are not winning a ton of games in 2024. That, to me, is why he is going to be the most important free agent signing. Unless, of course, you get Mr. Mystery Man, which I guess would be what? Stefan Gilmore in a time machine right now. <laughs> hey, they did They did have interest in trying to bring him back last year. Um, I, I think the Brissett point is important. Um I would be surprised if the third overall pick is not their starting quarterback next year. But I, I'm with you in the sense that I, I do believe that they're not going to put him out there if he's not ready. So, like, if if Jaden Daniels or Drake May, whoever it is, has a bad offseason or a rough training camp, I, I could absolutely see them saying, you know what, let's not rush this. And, you know, there are a, a bunch of examples of quarterbacks who have gotten ruined from – Starting too early, you know, David Carr with the Texans 25 years ago or whatever that was, 20 years ago. I've had people tell me that David Carr is like one of the most talented quarterbacks to enter the league in, in quite a while. It's just he got sacked like 75 times as a rookie or whatever it was. And he just he couldn't overcome that. Like it that really ruined him. And I've used this example a million times. Um, but Trevor Lawrence told me midway through his second season that he had to rebuild his confidence after his rookie season because everything there was just so much turmoil with urban meyer and the jaguars and and you know he didn't play well and uh, all these extra factors and, and then you know you can look at mac jones and the lack of development here over the last two years and um not to sidetrack this on the reasons why for well that, hold on i'm gonna like, sidetrack it real quick just because this guy retired last week and urban meyer did not know who aaron donald was right. back in his only season as a head coach of the jacksonville jaguars and that cannot be shared or said enough even on patriots podcast that an ex jaguars head coach <laughs> looked at the tape circled it and goes who's this 99 fellow for the rams <laughs> that happened continue yeah yeah not ideal um i feel like that should be 
the first question in every head coaching interview. Like, <laughs> do you know who Aaron Donald is? And if they can't pass that, you just dismiss them from the interview. Um, but yeah, look, you need you drafting and developing. It's not a cliche. Like, it's a real thing. And I, I think people around here certainly are, are more aware of of the perils of what happens when you you can't or you quit on developing a young quarterback. And I would say too, because the Mac Jones point is a real good one that not only are more quarterbacks um, broken by their franchises, then I would say the quarterbacks break them, right? Like the support and the environment, the ecosystem matters so much at that stage of development quarterbacks are maybe otherwise in life, but sticking here, like Mac Jones stepped into the best situation that any of those first round rookie quarterbacks had in 2021. And that's why he was partly, partly the best quarterback that year from that class since then. His environment has deteriorated, and Trevor Lawrence has gone up to his rightful place as water has kind of found his balance here as the best prospect in that class, now surrounded in a better environment. But just wonder for a second what Mac Jones would look like if, as a rookie in 2021, he had stepped into either situation that he had last year or in 2022 with Pepitre as his offensive coordinator. Like, he never reaches the heights that he did in 2021. So that part about, you know, it, it, it's it's the development and the draft and the timing like that's all interconnected it's not just the qb coach and the quarterback who's he throwing to who's protecting him what's the overall environment like the mac jones story is so different it might go in reverse frankly of how we last saw him if he was a rookie performing like he did this year had he stepped into the league with the current situation of the patriots offense or the one we saw in 2022 yeah uh, i mean this is like this does not get nearly enough attention. And I know, I think Lewis Riddick does a great job of making sure that like people hear this point. And, and he did it for a story I wrote before that 21 draft uh, when, you know, talking about the, the quote unquote quarterback graveyard and everybody wants to just label the quarterback a bust. And look, there are plenty who are, there are guys who would not have succeeded in any situation, no matter what that, that is absolutely true. But I, I, I there are so many situations, so many organizations that ruin quarterbacks or quarterbacks never would have had a chance to be as great or to, never had a chance to even be competent because of how bad everything was around them. And it's not hard to, to look around the league and figure out which teams and situations those have been. All right. We have three more. This is this is the big one. I think we're going to be in agreement. The draft will be far more important to the end result of the Patriots rebuild than this class and for agency. True or false? 100%. And, uh, that's the case with the Patriots and, and every organization in the league. Whether you're rebuilding or restocking or whatever, it's always got to be the draft. I love it. Um, I have some examples here. I'm just going to rattle up because I prepared them. Um, <laughs> but like, <laughs> if you want to look at recent rebuilds, if, you know, look, and this isn't to say people listening don't have a right to be pissed about Patriots for agency. I give it a final C+. Plus. You hit a bunch of assignments for an A or a B plus with all these signings, team-friendly contracts, they're good money or they're fair market deals. And then you just didn't show up to the final exam, which was getting a big receiver and all told comes out to a C plus. But when you look at any rebuild recently, right, the draft and what happens here in April is going to be so much more important than how you feel right now about that free agent class. It could be Josh Allen in Buffalo. It could be Houston with CJ Stroud. It could be Trevor Lawrence with the Jaguars, Jalen Hurts in Philadelphia. All of these rebuilds, center around a young quarterback who's been drafted and then developed. And if not, they use a first-round draft pick or some sort of uh, big asset like a Matthew Stafford and get a veteran quarterback and surround him with elite pieces. I mentioned Jared Goff, the Lions with Aiden Hutchinson, Penny Sewell, Amon or St. Brown, Jameer Gibbs. That's a more expensive, I think less likely route to rebuild. But whether the Patriots nail all of their picks rounds two through four or just get the quarterback at number one and have a so-so draft the rest of the way, that will all matter so much more to the next two, three, four-year trajectory of this franchise than just bringing back Jacoby Brissett and re-signing Mike Owen. Yeah, I, you brought up uh, the Lions example. Like, that is – it's so perfect because looking at their drafts um, under Brad Holmes, I mean, they're not just nailing their first-round picks, which they, they are. <laughs> and they've had, like, six of them because of that trade. Um, but they are just crushing it on day two and early in day three – and like, that's just, that's why they were able to explode really the last year and a half, because all of that young talent started to develop at the same time under a coach that they all want to play as hard as humanly possible for. And um, like, that's, this Lions thing is no fluke. Uh, 
just there's so much talent because of how well they've drafted in the first few rounds the last or I mean going on basically three straight years and the the difficult part about this right is that none of us will know unless there's an extreme result on one end of the spectrum or the other right Drake May makes I can't say the Pro Bowl because Mac was a Pro Bowl alternate as I'm often reminded but we won't know about the success or failure of this draft class for another couple of years. And that's a hard part. Free agency, you know pretty much right away. These are largely established commodities. They come in, they play well, good job. If not, well, that was a waste of a contract and capital. I'm just saying the patience is worth it. Ask the Lions, ask any of those teams that I rattled off where they built through the draft. It took them a little bit. Josh Allen's 2018 year, I was so convinced he was another bust. 2019, they're in the playoffs there. Should have won a game at Houston. Um, the Eagles, we've all seen them rebound quickly from the end of the Peterson era to Nick Sirianni. Everything with the Lions that you just mentioned, like it takes a little bit more time, but if it hits, it's absolutely worth it. This is something I'm going to lead on you uh, a lot more, and I won't have much to say. True or false? The Patriots have an image problem, including perception from agents, free agents, and other front offices. True, but that's the case for any team that – is coming off a four and 13 season. Uh, I mean, this, this is no long, like there's, there's some question over the new regime, of course, because they're new and unproven. Like it's, it's not like they have a retread head coach or there's a track record here. Um, you know, Elliot Wolf, as I've said to you a million times, is very well respected around the league. Gerard Mayo. Yes. Um, I mean, there's a reason why Gerard Mayo kept getting calls about interviews over the last several years. People really respect him. Uh, and his leadership and his presence and all that other stuff. So it's not about that. It's just, okay, this is new, and we want to see what this looks like. Um, there's skepticism over, all right, how much change will there be in the post-Belichick world? Um, are they, you know, I think Gerard Mayo has done a good job over the last couple months of conveying that it's going to be different in Foxborough, but people want to see these things. And then, you know, the other part, too, like, I know this sounds corny because we're from here, but, like, some people just don't want to play in the cold. Like they don't want to live in rural Foxborough. Like that's just, you know, when, when Miami's calling or somebody down South is calling and like, it's, it's appealing to be in nicer weather. And that is, that is a factor. Like all of these things, again, they sound, they might sound corny, but they do tend to add up. And when you are going into a season where, you know, you're still trying to rebound in the post Tom Brady era, and now everything is is a lot different. You know, you have to, uh, you, you just, you, for, quite frankly, like I said earlier, you've got to pay for these players to come up here. And once, until you were able to turn it around or until people start to spread the word that, hey, Gerard Mayo really is a great coach. Or, you know, if once the players start conveying that to their friends around the league or going into, um, you know, year two or what have you, you know, I'm thinking of the example of after the 2000 Patriots when they went to get, you know, they got a couple, um, Roman Pfeiffer is the one I'm thinking of. And some guys who were on that 2000 Patriots team were reaching out to Roman Pfeiffer and some other guys around the league. And they were like, hey, look, I know we just went six and ten, but like, I'm telling you, we're building something here. Like, you know, we were three and three down the stretch and that felt like a big win. And Belichick knows what he's doing. And I'm telling you, you're going to want to be here because when this thing starts to click, it's going to be good. And like, those are the things that sort of help accelerate a rebuild and like they matter. So again, like it's, it's just about kind of showing people what you, everybody's got a plan. Now you need to show how it's going to work. I hope that made sense. Yeah, that, that did make sense in two fronts. One of which I think is proof of concept, right? I think is what you're talking about. Let's yeah. see what it looks like. And even if the Patriots go, six and 11, five and 12, how does that finish look? How does Gerard Mayo come off in his press conferences? You know, and, and that didn't matter, right, under Bill, because Bill was anointed the greatest of all time years and years and years before he eventually left New England, right? That was the appeal. Come play for me, uh, as we heard from free agents, you know, even as recently as 12 months ago. That's gone. So how does, what it makes Gerard appealing? We heard from Antonio Gibson earlier this week saying the vibe is different. You know, you can tell he's kind of a player's coach. Once that gets around to the league in video clips, TikTok, any kind of sound clips, that'll help. You just need to see it first because we're not there yet. And they haven't played any games. So once they establish whatever this new Patriots identity is, then you can build on that, like you're saying, in that Roman five for who if we did top five names for linebackers of all time. I, I'm not quality, just a name. You are fitting, you were born to be a linebacker. Roman Pfeiffer's on that list, yeah. 
hundred percent. And he backed okay, it up good. his play too. So you just need to see it first. If, because otherwise, if you're out in San Francisco, you're down in Texas, or you're up in Green Bay, like you don't really know Gerard Mayo. You might know Elliot Wolf, but he's in the front office. What's the coaching like? What's the vibe like? The atmosphere. And then that might help serve as a tiebreaker. Uh, number two, you know, I, I put this question on here because there was a team source that relayed to uh, Doug, uh, Kyle, obviously, that he felt at the combine. You know, the, the shine was kind of worn off. Like, not a total loss of respect, but you could tell people were treating the Patriots differently from when they were the Patriots. And they were trying to get back to that, a level of respectability, which Elliot gave voice to in his press conference at the Combine. So I was just curious, because your frame of reference, your contacts, your network, far bigger than mine, and just what that might look like. And sometimes it is as simple as, hey, okay, here are the new names. We don't know anything about them. So, you know, we, we don't need to rush to get back to certain texts or pick up calls or really consider them if you're a player in free agency because they haven't spent a whole lot. They've been a bad team through the last four years. And come on, show me show me what you got. Yeah, I mean, speaking to people close with some of the premier free agents, we're just like, yeah, I mean, I don't, like, I don't think my client wants to play there. It's just people don't want to go lose and the Patriots have to prove that they have a, a path to winning more games than they have been doing over, like you said, mo most of the last four years. And there's no longer that attraction of like, I can go to play with Tom Brady and guarantee like a bad season is a loss in the AFC championship game. Like that era is, is very far in the rear view mirror at this point. So, but, you know, another part, too, it, and I don't want to make too much of this. I don't want it to sound like, oh, just because of Josh Uche, like all of this, you know, they're going to Disney World next year or whatever. But, like, I, I really think, like, if if Uche – so, all right, I'll back it up even more. Again, sort of a corny example, but, like, you know, Belichick is is big on making sure his edge guys are well-rounded. you got to set the edge. you got to play the run. you got to do all, like, the boring stuff, and then maybe you can get after the quarterback a little. Like if maybe Gerard Mayo says, you know what, I'm going to turn you loose. And, and I'm not saying you, you play a poor assignment football and you blow your, your gap or whatever. But if Gerard Mayo just says, you know what, Josh, just go get the quarterback. Don't worry about everything else. And, you know, have some fun on the field. I'm going to really make sure I spotlight you. Um, and, and if if you become a star, you know, everybody else on the defense is going to look better. Like if if something along those lines starts to happen, then again, like, there, the element of having some fun at the football facility is important for this generation of player. And I think everybody in New England, uh, we were all sort of conditioned to see like, OK, well, you know what? Belichick is not going to let you have, quote unquote, fun, but like you're going to win a lot of football games. And that's the reward. And when you're not winning football games and you're not having fun and you start to have the results that you see. Uh, so like some of that stuff that like, again, like. These might be small examples, but when you start to string enough of these examples together, they really do start to add up and matter. Yeah, I will say, too, you know, I, I think to that point, right, the conditioning was more, this is what winning football looks like. This is what it is. This is the only definition of what it is. And because of the success they had going to whatever it was, 10, 11 Super Bowls in 20 years, you're like, well, that makes sense because who the hell just gets to go to the championship 50% of the time? This must be the answer. There are other avenues to winning. And now the Patriots need to reestablish whatever that Gerard Mayo avenue to winning will be. In the meantime, as far as being an attractive destination, it is true. You brought up Josh Uche. He signed for a ridiculously low amount to stay in New England. Not long term on a one-year contract. Kendrick Bourne um, let the Patriots, as he said in this podcast, determine his value and take that. Now, he wasn't going to take a big pay cut or anything like that, as I said before. But there are players who want to be here. And that's the other half of the equation of those who re-sign here. They might have gotten a fair market deal or a team-friendly one. At least the players who have been here have enjoyed it and whatever they experienced, those at least who hit free agency, it doesn't go for all places. But I, I think the people who are here have experienced it. If you're on the outside, that's what still needs to be proven. Uh, which brings us to our last true or false. True or false, you have more confidence in the Gerard Mayo, thus Elliot Wolf regime, than you did two months ago when they were first formed together. Uh, false only because it's the same. Um, you know, I thought, you know, I said a couple of weeks ago, um, I believe probably to you, um, the Enwenu signing was, was going to be big. And if they lost him, unless it was for some ridiculous amount of money, like he went and, you know, got like Nate Solder, Joe Tooney, like historic 
money elsewhere. You know, I thought like that was an important piece to keep. Kyle Duggar is sort of still a TBA or TBD, um, yeah. but you know, they, they've kept their important players and there really is something to be said for that. You know, when you are, you know, Belichick did, maybe the drafting wasn't always there, but like the few players that he did draft well over, you know, the course of time and when they started to expire, their contracts expired and they, they left and you need to, you need to keep your good players. You know, those are your foundation. So I thought, a lot of the moves they've made were important. They didn't, you know, skimp on, you know, the Unwenu contract or, or whatever. You know, there are a handful of examples like that. Uh, you know, they again, they caught a break with Uche accepting a lot less than he had on the table elsewhere. But, you know, again, I, I think that's that's important. And it shows that Josh Uche really wants to play for Gerard Mayo. And uh, that sentiment that we've heard over the years, like he's a player's coach. You know, if that continues to come to fruition and they show it and they put the proof on the fields, you know, things will start to um, snowball in the right direction and or develop some momentum. So, like, they've done some good things. My perception of them has not changed. And so I'm not, you know, saying false, but I don't think it's like a bad false. That's where I land, too. But just for the sake of, of not agreeing on what now feels like half of these, I, I'm going to say true. And it is more to do with Elliot than it is Gerard, who I said at the time was a worthy gamble. This will be a long-term play. I don't think he's going to be a top 10 head coach, probably not even above average in his first year. It's a steep learning curve. He's been coaching for just five years. This is an incredibly difficult and different job from what he was used to as de facto defensive coordinator who wasn't even calling plays. Not to dismiss him. It's just a large gap. We'll see what happens when he springs and tries to make that jump. Elliot, though, in speaking with people around the combine, and agents and certain players and even ex-coaches who have not been in New England for a long time but still remember overlapping with him in 20 and 21, universally speak highly of him. And I don't know what to make of that except for you have to trust it at some point. Now, we need to see it in the numbers and the players, but we talk about Calvin Ridley and how this was a big blow, and I think it was. Period. End of story. If you want to find a silver lining here, though, it's the fact that that contract would have represented, had Calvin Ridley signed the reported offer of $22 million per year, double the highest offer that Belichick ever extended a wide receiver on an average annual basis. That sadly went to Nelson Aguilar at $11 million a year back in 2021. That is a huge shift from the previous regime in terms of their view uh, and beliefs about roster building and the importance of that position and how you spend it. It's not middle-class veterans spread it out. Kendrick Bourne here, Devontae Parker there. No, this is, I want a one. I'm willing to pay for it. They didn't get them. That's what matters most, right? We're not doing the Kings of interest here thing with the Red Sox, but you can see that they still believe in value with the contracts they signed. They did not sign a single bad contract in free agency. They didn't add difference makers, but I believe a little bit more in Elliot. There's nothing Gerard has done. I think that would be fair to judge him as far as being a head coach in the NFL, I think both of them have made some PR missteps, which, you know, again, we should all root for honesty. That's where that came from. Job being like, we got cash to burn. And then Elliot saying, we, there's a less hard-ass type of vibe. I'm like, great, please be honest with us. But as far as the best interest of, of making themselves look uh, publicly, yeah, probably best just to stash those in their pocket and not say it. Does that matter, though? Does it have a material impact on winning and building a culture and rebuilding a roster? No. I just think we're hung up more on that if you are someone who's taken a negative approach to both of them. And I say this again, it's only two months in. A lot of this is what I've heard from other people in the league that I trust. It's universally positive. I like the business they've done. A C plus is slightly above average for free agency. That's what Elliot's done. So I give him a slightly, slightly more belief. How about that? I think uh, <clears throat> two things here. One on the Ridley contract. Yeah, I've seen it's the reported numbers at 22 per year. But there's still like there's a lot of context missing there. And true, very true. You know, average annual value, it only goes so far when you're talking about like how close they realistically were. I mean, for a guy like Ridley, a receiver who's approaching uh being 30 years old, 22 by is it times three years? Like we don't know. I mean, a third and a fourth year is is extremely different uh when it comes to a contract for a player at that age. And we don't know what the guarantees were all that other stuff. So, you know, you could sit there and say, well, Tennessee got him for 23 and the Patriots offered 22, but we don't know what that 22 realistically looked like yet, or if we ever will. Uh, so I think that's important. And then I'm trying to think of what my second point was going to be. 
Somebody's ringing. This is the door fantasy door. draft coming back to bite you. Granted, we've almost <laughs> been going for an hour. We have at least five minutes, which as you were talking a uh, couple couple questions ago, I was thinking maybe we should do 15 off the field. But like, I don't want anyone to run out of gas for this separate segment. We're going to do a YouTube exclusive. Have I bought you enough time in the meantime to think of what your number two was? No. <laughs> <laughs> it probably wasn't that good then. That's okay. It, it's a, it's an excellent point, though. And I, look, have invited people who listen to this podcast to push back on, on things they say or provide feedback. I'm glad that you do, especially as someone who was closer to those negotiations and discussions than I was. Uh, it's a really important, you know, point, guarantees and context of all these contracts, as I think fans have slowly come around to learn. Stop looking at the maximum value. What is the base value of the contract? That said, let's say it was even down to 16 or $17 million per year in, like, actual money appreciable jump from Belichick, right? Like, I, I don't think Bill ever, I don't, maybe even initiates that conversation. Yeah, and you know what? I, I think that's absolutely important, too, because it shows, like you said, it's a different <clears throat> thought process, a different strategy. Like, Belichick's shortcomings in recent years were directly, t- or a, a lot of, in a lot of ways, directly tied to his unwillingness to really overexert himself at, at pre- premium positions and especially wide receiver. And it, I know things didn't work out for McDaniels and Ziegler with the Raiders, but like one of the first things they did was they took a big swing on Devonte Adams. And it was like, Oh my goodness. Like these guys just came from new England and they are getting, they are shaking the, the expatriate stuff off of them in a big way by going and getting Adams. I mean, you need, you need big time receivers uh, in this league at this point, like you just do. And you need to expect, you need to, uh, you need to spend on them or, or you need to devote premium assets to getting them. You know, yes, there are exceptions. Um, you know, Mahomes doesn't really necessarily have a bit, number one receiver, but he does have Travis Kelsey, who is more of a receiver than a tight end anyway. But whatever. Anyway, too far uh, on that <laughs> tangent. I did remember what my second point was. You mentioned PR missteps. And yeah. look, first time head coaches are always going to have them. Yes. Whether it happens in their introductory press conference or shortly thereafter, I mean, I remember a year ago, um, people were criticizing Jonathan Gannon uh, for a bad introductory press conference, and it looks like that guy knows how to coach. And Nick Sirianni got a lot of criticism his introductory press conference in Philly. That guy, I know it didn't end well for him last season, but he's clearly proven that he knows how to coach too. Um, you know, there are other ways. You know, some coaches get on on in front of the. Uh, media and they don't give you anything and they get criticized for that. And I'm not using Belichick as an example. There are others around the league who currently have jobs who are also showing an ability to coach. So uh, missteps come in various forms. Everybody's going to say something that they're going to regret um, in front of the media at some point because it's new and you know, you're, you're letting loose and, and whatever, maybe you put your foot in your mouth. Maybe you just say something that you wish you said a little bit differently. Um and they, those are just lessons that first-time head coaches all face. I mean, Belichick has said this before, like, you can always prepare yourself to be a head coach, but you truly don't know what it's like until you're sitting in that chair and, and these decisions. You have to make a million decisions every single day, and you're going to be making a lot of them for the very first time, or you're going to run into some type of adversity that you couldn't prepare for um, because you just weren't used to dealing with it as a position coach or a coordinator. Right. And I, I want to be clear again. The last point I say about having a little bit more belief in this regime started with, for the sake of not agreeing with Jeff Howe, this is not a proclamation of, I think they're off to some phenomenal start, or I think the Patriots will be any better than 5-12 and 12 next year. This is just to say, and from what I've heard and from what you've seen, there's difference. I think it leads positive. And let's also be clear, Devontae Adams did not lead to some giant big, you know, jump in wins over there. Uh, you know, I don't think I think from what I understand, the front office was remade a lot more than the coaching staff. The bottom line is, though, whether you take, you know, this newer approach that Elliott has or the old one that Bill has, the bottom line is winning. And whether it's their image issue, whether it's the quarterback or the development, it's all interconnected. It's all interdependent. And you need to win. And we won't see anything until September. In the meantime, we'll do things like true or false with seven, eight Patriot statements and see how they come out. But that's that's what it's going to be. Okay. The PR missteps, all of this is secondary to see how they can build a team. There are lots of ways of doing it. There are a lot of approaches to free agency, even if this feels uh similar and disappointingly so, you know, it could lead to something different. And it certainly will in the draft because the Patriots have not had a top three draft pick ever under 
um, you know, Robert Kraft's ownership or dating back to whenever was Bledsoe was the Bledsoe pick was not under him. That was still the previous ownership. Yeah. Right. Yep. Thank you. Okay. All right. Jeff Howe sealing the deal, closing it there uh, here for this episode of true or false. We're going to bring him back here on a separate YouTube exclusive. I said five off the field. It might be 15. It might just depend on the guest. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Uh, he's been Jeff Howe of the athletic national NFL insider. Come find out our conversation about what it's like to be an insider on YouTube, my new YouTube channel at underscore Andrew Kelly. 